Hello again, as you know, I'm Eli the Computer Guy, and today we're going to be talking about SMTP Relay, Simple Mail Transport Protocol Relay, right? So a lot of you guys, especially as new geeks, you guys want to run out there and you want to build email servers. I have no idea why you want to buy build email servers, they're just a colossal pain in the ass, but for whatever reason you guys want to run out there and you want to be like, I want to build my own email server, it doesn't matter if I can get the exact same quality service for free, but I want to build my own, right? So you're going to go out there and you're going to build your email server, and you're going to figure out how to set up MX records and all that kind of stuff, and email is going to start coming in, you know, bob at billybobob.com, and you're going to get all of your emails. And then what you're going to start doing is now that you're receiving emails, you're going to say, I want to send emails. And so you'll type up your emails, and you'll hit the send button, and then for some reason nobody will ever respond to you. You'll just keep sending out email after email after email after email, and nobody ever responds to you, and you'll start to feel lonely and you'll be like why doesn't anybody love me and the reason is is because all of your emails have been getting dumped into spam bins right uh, and the issue is uh, whenever you're looking at, at anything in the technology world right you have to look at all the different systems and all the different things that affect you know how things go so when you're receiving emails you have to set up your email server then you have to set up the MX records within your your internet DNS then you have to set up port forwarding uh, within your uh, within your uh, uh, router uh, to, to forward to your email service. And basically, there's all these things that have to be done. Well, when you're sending out email, there's also things that have to be done. And so basically, you have to configure your uh, your, your email server to be able to send the email. You have to make sure that your uh, the port is not blocked. Sometimes uh, your internet service provider will actually block your SMTP port. Uh, so sometimes that's blocked. Uh, and the other thing that comes up is you have to make sure that things like your IP address are not in blacklist for uh, companies like spam house so uh so you know you you know about spam blockers well the way that uh, a lot of the email the spam emails get blocked is because things like ip addresses are in blacklists and so when it when uh, an email comes in from any of those blacklists uh, it automatically gets dumped into the spam bin and so for a lot of t a lot of people uh your ip address is already in a blacklist so when email services receive emails from you even though it's a legitimate email it comes from that ip address it's in a blacklist so it automatically gets dumped into the spam bin or it's not a trusted IP address and then it gets dumped into a spam bin basically a lot of these a lot of these spam blockers you know when in doubt it's spam right and so the issue is you set up your server and you set up everything and SMTP is working right and all that stuff is working right but you keep getting dumped into the spam bin. And so one of the questions is, well, how can we prevent this? How can we deal with this? So with Eli, the computer guy, you know, we set up geekbraindump.com and geekbraindump.com is on its own dedicated server with its own mail server installed onto it. And the problem was a lot of notifications and a lot of things that had to go out to the users were getting dumped into the spam bins. So about 50% of our emails that went out would actually get into people's inboxes and about 50% would get dumped in the spam bin. And the reason was is because Spam House and all these spam blocks services don't trust our IP address and there was a lot of reasons for it but there, there it wasn't it wasn't worth messing with making sure our IP address was all squeaky clean it was easier to do something called SMTP relay so what SMTP relay is is what happens is your email server relays your, the, the message to another email server and then that other email server is what actually sends the email message to the, the recipient. So what normally happens is your email server tries to send the email message directly to the recipient. The problem is, is when you send directly to the recipient, that has your IP address attached to it. And if the IP address isn't trusted, we already went into that whole thing that goes in the spam bin. So what happens is you do a relay. Your server relays the, the, the email message to another server. That server then sends the email to the recipient. The recipient, when it receives the message, doesn't see your IP address. It sees the IP address of the SMTP relay and goes, oh, that is a known good and so it actually receives a, receives a message so that's why you do things like SMTP relay so why you would use something like an SMTP relay is if you're going to be using your own uh, if you're setting up your own email server and you don't have to want to worry about maintaining and making sure you're not in a blacklist or anything like that you would use an SMTP relay or again as we talked about before some ISPs block the SMTP port and so you can use a relay you can actually send email messages out on a different port 
uh, to, the, to the SMTP server, the relay server, and then the, the SMTP ser relay server will then send the messages out on the appropriate port. So when you're thinking about doing an SMTP, Relay. The question then is, well, how hard is how hard is it to get the service? And the cool part with SMTP Relay is, for the most part, is very easy. Almost all email services allow you to do SMTP uh, Relay to to one degree or another. So, uh, so GoDaddy, if you use uh, GoDaddy for your email service, I know it allows you to do SMTP Relay. It allows you to send up to 250 messages per day. Basically, it's it's very 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 easy. Uh, uh, Gmail allows you to do SMTP Relay. I think they allow you to do up to about 150 messages a day. So that is basically, it's a really easy thing. So when you're going to be configuring SMTP Relay within your server, literally all you have to do is you have to give it the SMTP server, the username, which is user, usually your email address, and then the password, and then that's it. It's basically, it's almost as simple as configuring like an Outlook client to be able to send out through SMTP Relay. So basically, like with uh, Geek Brain Dump, we, we have an SMTP plugin. Uh, I added the plugin, I put in all that information, and now our WordPress site then sends out uh, all the emails using that SMTP Relay. But you can use this for even more powerful server software, such as when I used to run an Exchange server. So when I had Eli the Computer Guy, the computer repair shop, and I had all those employees and everything, we had our own Exchange server. Well, within that Exchange server, there was actually a configuration buried way down somewhere that allowed you to set up an SMTP relay. So when you're thinking about SMTP relay, this is not like this is not some some low power thing that that isn't used for 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 higher power servers. You can use this for everything from WordPress sites to uh, to Exchange servers, and it'll work. So like with the Exchange server, literally all the email that my employees sent would all get routed through that SMTP relay and go out to the world that way. Basically makes your life uh, really easy. Now when you're thinking about doing SMTP relay, one of the things that you have to, to think about is how much are you actually in fact going to use it? Are you only going to send 100 messages a day or 250 messages a day or more? So one of the things we go over to the computer is we are looking at right now is actually using something uh, called SendGrid. So there are SMTP relay services out there that you can pay for. So you, you can simply go to to to, uh, to to Gmail. So Gmail, you know, the SMTP relay service, you can go in here and you can use this, this for free, right? But the question is, is, well, what if you're going to be sending out 500 messages a day or 10,000 messages a day or 40,000 messages a day, right? Let's say you have some kind of email blast server, something like that. Then you can go and you can actually pay for full-fledged uh, SMTP relay service. So a company such as SendGrid here, uh, this is one we're probably going to end up using. If you go, you can see for $10 a month, you can pay for up to 40,000 emails to be sent. So that's, that's a lot of outgoing emails. So I think for geekbraindump.com, that should be good enough for us. If you go up to $80 a month, that's 100,000, 200, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, again, this number may seem like a lot. Like if you're thinking like, well, 100,000 emails for $80, that seems like a lot of money. But again, remember in the real world of technology, a geek, if you're going to hire a geek as a consultant, they're going to cost you $100 an hour. Plus, if you're going to set up your own email servers, you need to build the email server and deal with all that kind of stuff. So realistically, these prices aren't that bad, especially if you're a professional, and especially down at this $10 a month mark. I mean, you pay $10 a month for an SMTP relay service, and you are, you are, you're just, I mean, it, it just works. You, you don't have to worry about it. They worry about the spam house blacklist. They worry about all of that kind of stuff, and you can just send your email messages out. Now, you don't have to use just like a company like SendGrid. There are a lot of SMTP relay services out there. I think no-ip.org sells them. Uh, Dyn DNS, I think, sells it. There's a lot of different SMTP relay services. So you can go out and take a look at, at what one you want to use. I'm personally, most likely, uh, we're going to start using SendGrid because they have some, some other cool functionality that I like. But that's basically all there is for SMTP relay. So basically with SMTP relay, if you have a server of some sort that is going to be sending out emails, again, uh, whether it's a full-fledged Exchange server, email, the Microsoft Exchange server, or it is a WordPress site that basically needs to send out the uh, emails for things like to activate uh, new accounts and that kind of stuff. What the SMTP relay then does is it allows that server to send email messages to a dedicated email server. And then from there, the message will be sent out to whoever the end user is. Again, the reason that you use this is, is one, 
things like ports and all that may be blocked. Uh, but really, the, bi the big one in the, in the professional world is really this whole problem with things like spam blacklists. Because uh, keeping up with that is a real pain in the butt. So it's nice. Again, you pay the $10 a month, and then you don't have to worry about that. You connect to their relay servers, and you just send out the emails. So that is SMTP Relay. Again, one of those simple little things that is incredible incredibly useful in the real world uh, and if you're a real geek and you're going to be setting up servers that have do any kind of communication you should definitely take a look at it play with it because smtp relay really is a lifesaver nerdswecanfixthat.com if you're thinking about starting your own computer services company but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system nerds we can fix that as a computer services franchise system they have 62 franchises throughout the united states they can franchise in every state other than hawaii they also franchise internationally if you're thinking about starting your own computer services company you should contact them fill out the information below or give them a call again as i will say franchise systems are great for a lot of people not so good good for others always make sure to do your due diligence but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway you might as well contact nerds we can fix that to see what they have to say altero.com a-l-t-a-r-o.com if you're dealing with virtualization in a hyper v environment so we're talking about windows server 2008 r2 2012 and 2012 r2 take a look at altero.com they have a number of hyper v backup solutions they have the free version which will back up up to two vms for free forever they also have the unlimited version start starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. Total Seminars, totalsim.com. If you're looking for your A+, your Net+, your Security+, Plus certification, they have video training, practice tests, exam vouchers, and more. If you are on the CompTIA track and you are looking for study prep material, study guides, that type of thing, take a look at Total Seminars, totalsim.com, T-O-T-A-L-S-E-M.com. AdAccess.com. If you're dealing with Active Directory on a large scale, so you have hundreds of users to add, hundreds of users to disable, so on and so forth, you may want to take a look at AdAccess.com. This is Active Directory management and automation software. So this tries to automate and simplify the Active Directory workflow. So if you are in a large scale Active Directory infrastructure, take a look at AdAccess.com. Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer, what devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analyst analysis tool. Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer in the show that are technical in nature, you know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the Spiceworks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at Spiceworks.com. Veeam.com, V-E-E-A-M.com. If you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up, they have solutions for ESXi, they have solutions for Hyper-V, and as you guys like, they have free stuff. So if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution, take a look at Veeam.com. So the hands-on review today is for the VanQuest, what the hell is this called, Maximizer Organizer. So you guys are going to go out there and you want to get all the fancy tools. You want to get little uh, cable, cable testers and butt sets and all that kind of stuff. But the question is, is what are you actually going to put all of these things in, right? You've got scissors and you've got punch down tools and you've got testers and you've got this and that and the other thing. And a lot of you guys are just going to kind of dump that into your, uh, your lab 
laptop bag and that is going to be a complete mess. Now back in the day when I started my consulting, uh, you know, being a consultant, as I talk about, I used to have a little green bag, a little green army, uh, you know, basically mechanics tool bag and I would take that everywhere. It's a little small bag, not too much bigger than this and I would put all of my stuff in there and everybody used to laugh because I would walk in with my little green bag but then I would fix all the problems and then they would stop laughing because all of the problems have been fixed. So this is kind of like a modern version of that little green bag that I used to use and it is actually a very nice bag especially for any of you IT professionals that you have to go into the field because it's very useful for uh, for keeping all of your stuff kind of in place. So this is actually pretty well kitted out. So let's go over to my little demo desk and I can show you uh, what this thing looks like. So they gave me a number of these different bags but this is the one uh, that, that I've kind of set up for this little demonstration. As you can see um, you know it's about it's a little bit bigger than my hand so it's you know whatever size that is and I've got all kinds of stuff in there. So you can put your butt set on here. Again you got a bag on the outside. This is the the multimeter and the, uh, the, the cable tester and then if we open this thing up oops, you can see all the other stuff that you're able to shove in here. So this is a this is a toner set so you, you can plug this into your your network cable and, and tone tone it out. You know we've got the scissors and we've got the punch down tool and we've got the, the razor knife. These are incredibly valuable in the real world. Then we've got the small screwdriver, then we've got the big screwdriver. You know, they've got all kinds of pockets here, so then you could throw in like little USB flash drives or whatever else. Again, I mean, like I say, when you start looking at how much I was able to shove in here, I mean, this this is this is a pretty big mass of stuff. So, so don't think it's a small bag. So you could literally, you could put one of those small uh, external hard drives in here. Basically, whatever equipment you're using. You know, this, this is the normal kit that I used to carry around. So with that, I mean, basically, I mean, it's built very well. It uses, I don't know, military spec cloth or whatever. And I will say, having having dealt with military type equipment, I mean, it is built very well. Um, so that's one problem too, is you go out and you buy some fancy kit bag and all of a sudden it starts falling apart three seconds after you bought it. The nice thing with this is, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's it's built well, <laughs> so you're not going to have to worry about it ripping and going to hell. Um, you know, you can see out here um, they've got the uh, you know thing, so you could secure this to uh, to whatever other kind of bags or whatever else you got. So it's 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 a pretty good deal. So this is the biggest size one that they sent me. They also have different versions that I'm not sure how good they are uh, for for the tech field. But this is the biggest one, and this is the one that I actually prefer because it's got that kind of stuff. Then there's another big one here. One thing to realize if you're going to be buying this VanQuest equipment is that the different versions have different layouts for these uh, these pockets. So when you buy them, just make sure what layout of pockets you want. So pockets here are on the side, pockets here are on the top. You, you decide whether or not you like that. There you go. Then they have these small ones. One of the things that I would say is if you're going to be a computer geek, buy the big ones. Again, the big one can fit all of this stuff in there. These small things, I'm not really sure what a geek would use. I mean, because I mean, like I said, this is that big. I mean, if you look at the size difference, or it's a really big size difference. This is something that I would see from like the, my old search and rescue days. I mean, you put in like a little med kit, so everybody has their own med kit or their little survival kit. I could see using that, but. I wouldn't really see using this in the computer spectrum, uh, IT world. So just keep that in mind. But I really do like the big ones. And like I say, they're nice and they're built very well. If you're interested in actually taking a look at these guys, I have no idea where you would normally buy them. I guess you would buy them online. Uh, and you can just go to their website called vanquest.com. Then you go down, and these are called the maximizer organizers. And you can see the price. Uh, so the biggest one that I was showing you was 26 bucks, and it goes around to that small one was 15 Again, I, I would stay away from the small one. I think it's just too small. But this $25 one I think is a good deal, and you can go in, and you can see all the information. Again, you know, for any of you guys that, especially, you know, you run your own computer, uh, computer shops and you have employees, I mean, this is just a good thing. I mean, you can put all kinds of stuff into this kit and then just hand that to your employee. So, you know, if you have field, uh, if you have field technicians, you can, you can stock all this with the equipment they need and just hand it to them. And then this is their kit. So I, I, I really do. I, th I think this is a, I think it's a good little widget. I mean, again, it's one of those things a lot of you guys don't think about. A lot of you guys are like, Eli, it's not a switch. It's not a piece of networking equipment. But again, when you go to a client site, 
how easy is it for you just to sit down, pull out your equipment, do what you need to do, pack up your equipment and walk away. I'm telling you, it's those little things in life that, that make you seem cool and will make your life a lot easier. So again, this is the VanQuest. What the hell is this? The VanQuest Maximizer Organizer. And again, the big one, the big one is a thumbs up. The big one, $26 one is a thumbs up. And again, if you're doing search and rescue, I would buy a small one. I, I don't know what an IT guy would do a small one. But the big one, I definitely I think is something that you should take a look at. So this question comes from Chris S. Um, I was talking with some people on an IRC network, and the guy said that he ran 100 meters of Ethernet cabling, then plugged it into a hub that he used as a repeater and ran another 100 meters of cabling. The guy seemed full of it, but I was wondering if this would work, uh, if it does, how well. So the question then is, is, is we all should know when you run in a Cat5, an Ethernet cable, TCP, IP, and all that, right? You should only run it uh, approximately. Approximately, eh, approximately 100 meters. I've heard people run it a lot farther than 100 meters and have it work fine. I've heard people run it shorter than 100 meters and it not work so well. That whole 100 meter thing with, with Ethernet cabling also has a lot to do with your networking equipment. Again, Cisco equipment, you can kind of stretch that length a little further than if you're using you know, some other piece of crap. But basically what this guy is saying is, okay, so we ran 100 meters, then we connected that to a hub, and then we went another 100 meters meters. So can you do that? Basically act as a repeater. And so that that's what used to happen way back in the day with something called a bridge. Not a wireless bridge. You guys are all used to wireless bridges now. But way back in the day there was something called a bridge. And so what a bridge did is, is basically um, it prevented, uh, it basically separated out networks uh, for broadcast storms. But the, the thing with a bridge that was kind of cool is basically a packet went in one side, it was then recreated so basically it was copied and sent out the other side therefore you could use it as the equivalent of a repeater because you do a hundred meters the packet goes into the bridge it then gets read and recreated and sent out the other side. So essentially, that next 100 meters is as if it was a brand new 100 meters. So you could. So if you could connect a bridge in the middle to do this. So uh, I forget what the hell it was. Like network ascent, networking essentials is the test I took on this. And as I recall, theoretically, you could do this like three times. Like you could do 100 meters bridge, 100 meters bridge, 100 meters bridge. It was something like that. There was some theoretical, theoretical limitation but yeah so the question is, is okay well what about if you put a hub in the middle of this and here's the thing basically the question is, is are you putting an actual hub or are you putting a switch so what is a switch basically a switch is a multi-port bridge so so that's that's what that's what a switch is is that whole mac you know the, the whole filtering arp and all that kind of stuff right uh when you look at a switch um that is a multi-port bridge so if you put 100 meters connected that to a switch and then put another 100 meters on the other side that would in fact work and the reason is because the packet travels along the 100 meters it goes into a switch switch reads the information recre recreates the packet ships it out the other side uh and therefore it's the equivalent of new 100 meters so you could put a switch in the middle uh, to, 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 to span more than 100 meters. Mm. Question then comes up, is an actual hub? Mm. Most likely not. If you're using an unpowered hub, uh, probably not a chance in hell, right? Because again, remember, what is the difference between a switch and a hub? A switch actually has brain power. It reads the packets. It sends the packets out into the specific port. It has all that stuff going on. A hub, all a hub is is basically a splitter. Uh, you know, like a coax splitter that you would use in your house to, to, to send the cable signal to different TVs? That's basically what a hub is uh, for, for cable. So uh, a signal comes in on one port, and then it literally blasts out all of the other ports. There's no brain power. It doesn't recreate the packets. It doesn't do anything that. It just literally splits that out. So there's something called an unpowered hub that used to be used way back in the day. Uh, literally, there's no power to it. It's it, it, all, it, all the power, everything actually comes from the line. So if you had a line that went 100 meters, uh, then went into an unpowered hub, there's pro again, there's probably not a chance in hell that would actually work. There are then called powered hubs. So powered hubs are the uh, same thing as an unpowered hub, except it, it actually adds a little bit of power there. 
Um, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it wouldn't work. That's kind of one of those where you kind of like scratch your chin and go, maybe that would work. I mean, like, I don't want to say it wouldn't work. Uh, there's no way in hell I would do it. <laughs> There's no way in hell I would do it and put my name on it, but who knows? Maybe it would work. So that would be that would be what I would say. So if you are if he's trying to use an unpowered hub in order to bridge a connection, I would I would imagine there's no way in hell that would actually work. If you use a switch, if you use a switch, yes, that would definitely work. If you use a powered hub, uh, maybe. But again, the question then becomes, you know, what is an actual hub? For most of you young folks out there, you probably haven't really seen hubs. I mean, really, like when we talk about hubs, I have not seen hubs in the real world. I mean, like hubs in the real world. So, I, you know, I'm saying like the 90s, like the late 90s hubs were old. You get what I'm saying? So he may be saying hub but actually meaning switch hubs are something that that's that's very hard to find so i hope that hope that answers it yes in fact you can like i say you can do repeaters or bridge networks 100 meters to a bridge or a switch to another 100 meters to a bridge or a switch again theoretically i think there's some limitation on that but again a lot of that has to do with your networking equipment if you have if you have enterprise uh, class cisco networking equipment you can get away with a lot more than if you have some crappy stuff that you you know some you know generic thing you bought from china So this question comes from Antonio Yu. Hope all is well. I was wondering which mobile phone you carry with you the majority of the time. I work in IT, and for IT purposes, I am noticing that Android has more tools, per se, for IT-related tasks. The iOS restrictions currently do not allow for such things as app Wi-Fi analyzer and just small tools, which can be an advantage when in the field. So the question is, is what... Android or yeah, what Android? Yeah, there you go. Uh, what smartphone do I use when I when I'm out in the real world? And as I will say, the the smartphone that I use is the Galaxy S4. So I do use an Android phone. Is it because you can have more networking wireless IT type tools? Uh, absolutely not. I actually just like the 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 Android phone. Uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, this question comes up, uh, at least for that I see, with a lot of new people in IT. You know, basically, you know, new people in IT, they want all the latest and the greatest and all these fancy, cool tools. And, and what I'm going to tell you, at least what I found, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how long he's been doing IT or technology, but at least what I have found is that realistically, at the end of the day, most of those those cool, fancy tools actually, in fact, don't get used. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's you go and you want to buy all these fancy tools, and then you buy all the fancy tools, and then you find out you don't need the fancy tools because it's absolutely and utterly obvious what's going on. Like, back when I used to do wireless networking, and I had to figure out, you know, the wireless access points and you know, RF frequency and all that kind of stuff, you know, and you think, yeah, if I'm going to be installing all these wireless access points, I need like Wi-Fi anal analyzers to know exactly what the signal is, blah, 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 blah. And what I found in the real world, right, especially going into buildings in Baltimore, because buildings in Baltimore, we have thick, thick cement walls and thick brick walls and all kinds of weird, nasty construction when it comes to Wi-Fi. And so basically what I found here in the Baltimore area is you can take your tablet computer, you take your laptop computer, and basically you, you set up your wireless access point and you walk through the premises and, and basically you see how good your signal is. But, you know, not, not using any fancy Wi-Fi analyzers. You can just sit there and play around on the internet and see if it's working appropriately. And essentially when it stops working, you're like, huh, Oh crap, I lost my Wi-Fi signal. And then you look around and you see a big old three foot, you know, thick brick wall. And you don't exactly need a Wi-Fi analyzer to figure out what's going on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, look, there's a three foot brick wall in between me and the access point. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So I think that would be my thought here is, is I am sure because just, just cause, cause Android is a Linux operating system with Linux operating systems, more of the geeks go to that type of thing. I'm sure there are more IT tools uh, for Android. And so if you're really worried about it, I would, yeah, I would say yes, buy an Android phone. But what I would argue, at least from an old timers perspective is, is most of these tools they end up not being as useful or as valuable as you think. You download all the stuff, and then you realize, man, 
it's a three foot brick wall. I, I, I know what's going on here. You, you get what I'm saying? So, uh, so that's what I would say. And, or again, if you really need something like a real wife and that's, see, that's the problem you get into with this is you're like, yeah, but what if I really need a Wi-Fi analyzer? And it's like, well, if you really need a Wi-Fi analyzer, then you buy a fluke. You get what I'm saying? It's kind of like one of those, like if you're on the, the, in the Android world, you know, you're using your smartphone, most likely it doesn't matter to you. Some people it will matter to, but from 99% of the IT population, if you're using your smartphone to do Wi-Fi analysis, it probably doesn't matter a lot. Uh, if you really do need to do Wi-Fi analysis, then you go out and you purchase the fluke. Kind of get what I'm saying. So that, that would be my thoughts. Yeah, if you really, if you want more apps for IT, buy Android, but I would bet you at the end of the day, you'll, you'll spend 50 bucks on apps and then never actually use them. So for the final thoughts for the today, I'm going to talk to you guys about my new inclination to start banning people. Yes, that is right. Eli has finally had enough. I have had enough. I am a geek, and you cannot push me any further or something like that. So one of the things that you have to understand in business, whatever you're going to be doing, is that you need to be able to change um, how you do things every once in a while. You need to modify how you do things. You need, to, you need to come up with reasons that you do things, and then if that turns out to not work for you, you just have to kind of change course. In the startup world, that's called pivoting, but basically in the normal adult world, it's just kind of called changing your mind. And so one of the things that I have decided to do is I have decided to start banning people um, and basically start deleting posts and all that kind of stuff on YouTube. And this is, this is a massive change for how I've been dealing with my YouTube channel and comments and all this uh, for the past four and a half years, the past three years that I've been on YouTube. So up until this point, up until basically yesterday, um, I... I, I have really, really, really not tried to censor anybody at all. Um, basically, I, I ban people uh, very infrequently. I delete posts very infrequently. And the only time that I do is when people are, are saying things that basically are trying to be trolling above and beyond anything that anybody would, would, would be considered normal, such as people who do, quote, quote, you know, quote, unquote, nigger, nigger, nigger. Uh, and that's like their comment those people need to go away. But otherwise, um, you know, I haven't really, um, I haven't really blocked anybody, haven't really banned anybody. I figured, okay, it's, you know, everybody can do whatever they want. I am not going to try to censor anybody. But what I've been finding uh, over time is that I'm just kind of getting tired of trolls. I'm just kind of getting tired of trollish behavior. And I just, you know what? As a successful business person, again, like I say, in the whole video web content creation world now, I just don't want to deal with it anymore. Like this entire business, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you, I make a, good, a very, very good salary off of this business, but I make a very good salary off of this business by trying to make your lives better. Again, as I always say, I just want my 10%. If I can help you make an extra $1,000, I just want my 100 You know what I'm saying? Like if I can help you make an extra $10,000, I'd like my $1,000. Um, yeah. Yes, I do want my cut, but I want my cut from actually fundamentally improving your life, fundamentally improving your position. And so, you know, I get a lot of people, I, I put, and that's the thing, is all the content I put out for you guys, um, I try to make sure that it is relevant. I don't put up cute cat pictures. You know, a lot of a lot of these YouTubers and a lot of these personalities, they put up cute cat pictures and they put up like stupid little, you know, viral stuff. And, and I don't. Uh, everything that I post to any of my channels has a reason for it. You may not particularly like the reason for it, but it has a reason. I post all the stuff from geekbraindump.com because I want to promote you guys. I, I post all of my stuff because I want to promote myself. Uh, there's other things that I add in there and I just do that because I think that it is a very, um, it's useful for you guys. And so like yesterday I, I posted this this video from, from a YouTube creator called iJustine. Now if you ever heard of iJustine, let me tell you, iJustine is like, whoa! I Justine is who most of us want to be. She's got like 2 million subscribers and makes lots of money and all kinds of wonderful things. Personally, I don't like most of her content. I do have to say, I, I Justine is one of those people that I highly respect. I've actually met her uh, before and I highly respect her. I just don't like what she does. And, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to like what somebody that you do respect does. But it was interesting. I was, I was flipping through her channel yesterday and... Um, 
there's this weird little cheeseburger video that popped up. And I was like, huh, I wonder what this is. Because it was only like a minute and 20 seconds. So I was like, well, okay. I don't want to watch 10 minutes of I Justine, frankly. But I'll, I'll watch a minute and 20 seconds what I Justine is saying. It was about cheeseburgers. And basically, it was this little video about her trying to order a cheeseburger at a restaurant. And going in there and wanting a cheeseburger. knowing, going, Walking in the door and knowing that she wanted a cheeseburger. And then how the waiter kind of like messed around with her. Like, don't do you want a sea bass? And she's like, no, I just want a cheeseburger and it was kind of like one of those interesting funny things because it, it, it is a it is an interesting commentary on the whole sales process where people come to you they know exactly what they want they're willing to write the check they're willing to give you the money and then somehow you talk them out of the sale or you make them feel unconfident you know what I'm saying like uh, you know a pretty young girl walks in and wants a cheeseburger and then she keeps being asked well don't you want the sea bass or the mahi mahi and all of a sudden it's like I don't know do I really want a cheeseburger all right so I posted this just because it was a minute and 30 seconds and it was cute and it was fun. It really was cute and really was funny and it really was a commentary on the whole sales process. And then I got some nastiness from it. And, um... And you know, I was just sitting there and like one of the, one of the, one of the comments was like negative one for posting this crap. And I don't know what it was. You know, you talk about those, those times in life where things change and when things shift and you know how, you know, nothing after is quite like it was before. And I was sitting there and I was thinking about this I Justine post because I honestly put that up there because A, I thought it was funny and B, I thought it was relevant. It's not really about it funny, but I thought it was relevant to the fan base. And then I'm looking at this post that says, you know, or this comment that says negative one for posting this crap. And I just sat there and I looked and I was like, you know what? You're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. You, you don't need to be bothered with this kind of post at all. I completely understand that you should not be bothered by this kind of post at all. Ban. <laughs> Gone, right? And I'm just going to start doing that more because I, I am just tired of the trolls. I'm just tired of the nastiness. I am just tired of every single day putting out content that for greater or lesser extent, tries to make your guys' life better, and then these nasty little pieces of crap are just like, yeah, you suck. And so, just so you know, the, the, the yesterday, things changed. And so I am, just so you guys know, I'm going to be banning people more and more and more and if you swear, again, like, I've talked about this a little bit before. Like, I started banning people a little bit more, but now it really is. It really is that we're all going to talk polite or you're going to get banned. If you're going to give me negative one, why are you posting this crap? You're going to get banned. If you tell me that this is the effing stupidest thing you've ever seen in your life, you're going to get banned. If you if you say nice things, though, please don't please don't take this wrong. It's, it's you know, if we have a nice, polite conversation, you say, Eli, um, I see what you're trying to do here, but I... I I really think you missed the mark. That's understandable. Or, hey, Eli, I see that you're, you're doing a lot of stuff on WordPress right now, but I, I would argue that I think if you did things on Cisco, that might be more valuable. Uh, you know, that's polite and nice. But if you're going to be like, basically, if you're going to be trying to talk to me like a 14-year-old, I'm kind of done with you. And I think this is kind of like the maturing of the whole social networking world. Um, because it's like uh, popular science uh, was very interesting. Uh, a couple years ago, popular science actually uh, killed the commenting system uh, on popular science com or popsci.com and what the reason was is they, they found all that trolling behavior um, actually had a negative influence upon the readers and so what they decided is we're just going to scrap all the commenting because we don't want that to invade the, the the reader's perspective and I think as we we grow in social networking I think that's that's what needs to happen more and more is more of us need to start saying you know I'm done with this crap if you want to be trolling and you want to be nasty and whatever you can go to your little 14 year old bulletin board service but here for Eli the computer guy, I, I, I'm, I'm done with you all. I, 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 banned, I banned him. Uh, I banned him for saying negative one for posting this crap. Because obviously that guy, uh, he can, yeah, I, I don't want to ever bother him again with the crap that I'm posting. So he got banned. And then another guy was saying that I effing wave my arms around too much. It's annoying. Stop effing waving your arms around too much. It's annoying. And again, I, I completely understand. You should not. You should not have to effing watch my hands move around. So he got banned too. So, uh, so yeah. Again, those are the final thoughts. The things that go on in the real minds of business people. And sometimes they're just these, ma sometimes they're just massive mathematical equations with metrics and all that. And other times it's just like sitting there and going, you know what? I'm tired of you people. Bam! So there you go. People, be nice. Just be 
nice is what I have to say. So tonight we're having our second Geek Happy Hour. So I'm excited about that and we will see how it goes. Again, just to show you guys how meetups grow slowly over time. You can see we're now up to 108 geeks in our Geek Happy Hour meetup. We have nine people to come in tonight and it's just trucking along pretty well, pretty well. So the main thing that I wanna show you guys with showing you how things like geekbraindump.com grows and how Geek Happy Hour grows is to remind you that not everything starts out successful. It's not like it starts out successful and massive day one. It has to grow over time. Again, remember, um, I used to go into Baltimore Tech Breakfast. I remember three years ago when it was eight geeks sitting around a table and now it's a massive thing, right? So hopefully, hopefully this means that Geek Happy Hour will be getting bigger and bigger. So we're going to be going down to N. Poynton Still tonight, which is like an Irish restaurant, Irish bar. They're going to have good old Irish music and it should be a fun time. And look, it looks like Ron will be there so we have ron is coming there we have a few other people we have a couple of startup founders we have a digital agency guy so it should be fun tonight so the meetup is growing and geek brain dump is growing so just showing you guys all of this cool stuff that is happening 